So Amit Singhal uh, actually invited me to dinner with uh, Jeff here uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and uh, it, it was, uh, I think we would probably talk for three hours in that, and we probably could have talked for 10 hours, because the area that he's, uh, he's interested in is one that Larry is also interested in, which is machine intelligence, and uh, how do we push to the next generation, and that's obviously really important to our company. Um, but he has a, an entire career where he's basically built from graduate school on uh, a mechanism to basically allow him to study uh, what is, I think, one of the most fascinating fields that any of us uh, will ever be involved in. And uh, it's biologically inspired, you know, machine intelligence. And, I th you know, for me, it combines two really, really interesting things. One is obviously computing and how we commute and things like that, but, but more importantly, how we think, how, hu how humans think. And I think what was really exciting to me is the advances made in biology to understand what the mind does. And, uh, and how it processes things, and uh, the different mechanisms it uses. And what it really came, out, came to me was it's an entirely different computing model, and I think that's what's so exciting about it. Uh, so I won't go into a, a, you know, the long and illustrious history. I'll let Jeff do that. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just so pleased and uh, happy, uh, both that he could come and, uh, and all the interest in the room here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. Well, I don't need that. I should. I should um, I should be good with this mic. Hopefully you all can see me. Well, thanks for coming out here and just keep piling in and sit wherever you want, I guess. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not going to tell you about my long career. <laughs> I'll skip all that. Uh, I've had two careers, one in mobile computing and now another one in brains and neuroscience. But really, it's the brains and neuroscience is the one that's been going on for a long time. Um, so I'm going to talk about machine intelligence. I'm going to talk about what it is. I'm going to talk about how I believe we can get there and what we're going to do when we get there. Um, and some of the parts of the talk will be pretty technical, some will be less so. I'm going to start off a um, uh, little bit sort of intro history here. My approach to this, hopefully this is going to work now, let's try this. Oh, I have to hit down, that's it. My approach to this uh, has been the following. Um, it's a very biological approach. It's first to discover the operating principles of the neocortex, and once we understand those principles, we can then build machines that work on those principles. Um, and the neocortex, just in case you've forgotten, it's the uh, big wrinkly thing on the top of your brain. It's about 75% of the volume of your brain. It's where all high-level thought, language, um, vision occurs. Anything you can tell me about the world is stored in your neocortex. Mine's speaking, yours is listening. That's the organ of intelligence. Uh, our approach is like the following. Oops, oops, I'm going backwards. I've got to get used to this. Um, our approach is the following. We start with very detailed anatomy and physiology. I'm more of a neuroscientist. I'm a machine learning person in some ways. Um, I view the brain as a set of constraints. This is uh, the one proof case we know that this can be done, and, uh, and we know a lot about the anatomy and physiology of the brain and all kinds of stuff, and, and if we're going to have a theory about what intelligence is, it has to be consistent with that. We don't have to emulate all of that, but we at least have to realize that that is a set of constraints. From that, we develop theoretical principles. We can test those empirically back in the neuroscience, but we can also test them by building the stuff in software and, and, and experimenting it, which is what we're doing today. Uh, ultimately, this is going to go into silicon. We've had, actually got one project starting this year with another uh, major computing company to do some silicon of our algorithms. But um, today it's all in software. Now, I thought I added a few slides here at the beginning of my talk, which I don't normally do. Uh, I wanted to give you a little sort of historical perspective, because I know there's a lot of people here in the machine learning community and some really experts. And I just want to give you a little bit my view of wh where we've come from and how we're getting there. So I'm going to go back in time. We're going to start sort of the history of AI. This guy, Alan Turing, is where I begin uh, in AI. He, uh, in starting in the 1930s, he started talking about computers as universal machines, the universal Turing machine, as we call them now. And he was very much interested in computer uh, intelligence. And he thought we could make computers intelligent. Uh, he didn't want to get in arguments about it. He, sp he wrote about this. He says, I didn't want to argue with people whether it's possible, whether machines can be conscious. So he said, I came up with the idea of the Turing test specifically. So we just said, look, if, if a machine could pass the Turing test, we'll just have to agree it's intelligent. And so that's what he did. So, and he wrote that paper in 1950, the one that's shown right here. And this is sort of the beginning of the AI movement. Unfortunately, what this did is it set the idea that the goal of AI is to do things that humans do. And I don't, uh, I don't think that's the goal of machine intelligence. Um, we don't have to replicate what humans do. We can do things that are super or less. It doesn't, it's not that specifically. So the, the field of AI went on for many years. It's still going on. I call it the no neuroscience approach. Uh, there's been many uh, projects and techniques developed over the years, uh, qu some quite successful, uh, some less so. I've shown some pictures of some of the great th uh, achievements here, playing chess, winning a Jeopardy. I put the Google car there. I want one. Um, 
major initiatives. My summary of this is the good news about it, you can come up with good solutions to problems we care about. Um, the bad thing is that they're very task specific. They're kind of brittle. They don't really, you know, the Google card doesn't, isn't going to play chess. It's not going to do my laundry and it's not going to think about physics. Um, and, and so they're very task specific and they have limited or no learning. And, in, and what makes us, makes intelligence for human, of course, is we learn about everything. And I can do all those things and so can you. And so I don't, I never viewed this as a really great way of getting to true machine intelligence. Um, now let's talk about the history of artificial neural networks, the, so the brain approach, if you will. I, I start this back in the age, uh, back with these two guys, Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts. They wrote a paper in 1943 where um, they talked about, well, you know, neurons could be like logic gates, and if we put them together, we can do computing with them. So that's an interesting idea. Well, it's really not the way brains work at all, but they, but what they did is they introduced the idea of an artificial neuron that can be used in an artificial neural network. Uh, now, their approach was kind of odd. They, on the left, you see a real neuron. In the middle, you see what is a classic artificial neural, neural neuron, which is a sort of a sum to uh, weights and an activation function. That's nothing at all like a real neuron. And on the right is what McCulloch and Pitts showed, which is these little, like, really, really ridiculous neurons were doing ands and ors and nots. But that was the beginning of the AI, I mean, the uh, artificial neural network era. Um, over the years, been many, many different things in this category. You really can't put them under one, one category. Um, but I, I call them minimal neuroscience, you'll see in a moment. So starting in the, in the 80s, we had a real resurgence in interest in artificial neural networks, backpropagation, bolts machines, and so on. This is continuing on today into the field of machine learning. Uh, and the current hot topic there is the leap beef, belief networks. Um, and I would say the good news about this is, well, these are learning systems. That's good. They're distributed. That's good. Um, they're really good classifiers. That's what mostly they're used for, for sort of classification problems. The downsides is they're very limited. They don't do much more. Um, there's a few exceptions to that. Uh, and they're not brain-like at all. And I don't, it, it didn't feel like this is, when, I, when these came hot again in the mid-80s, and I was working on this in the mid-80s, I was very disappointed because people didn't, they weren't really paying attention to neuroscience. They were just saying, hey, we have these neuron-like things, and we're doing stuff with them. And we know a lot from the brains. We should be going back to them. And lately, there's been another thrust here, which I call, which you might call like the whole brain simulator. This is maximal neuroscience. You might have heard about this. There's a project in Europe under Henry Markram called the Human Brain Project. And uh, their goal right now, this got a huge amount of funding. Their goal is to simulate an entire brain from the ion channels to the spikes to the neurons to everything up to you know, psychology. That chart in the middle is the principal researchers on this project. It tells you how many people are working on this. <laughs> Uh, they do these great simulations. The problem with this is there's no theory. They'll admit this. There's no theory. They have no idea what this is supposed to do. They're like, hook it all up and see what happens. And, it, and it's not going to lead to machine intelligence. We need theory. We need uh, principled ways of going about this. So that takes me back to my approach, which is essentially like, look, you've got to pay attention to brains. We don't have to copy everything that goes on the brain, but you better understand what it's doing before you decide what else to do. Uh, and that's the approach I've been taking. So I'm going to walk you through the progress we've been making recently, and that's really cool. Um, first of all, we have to talk about a little bit about the neocortex. It's a memory system. So if you think about it as a computer, forget it. It's not. It's a memory system. It's, uh, when you're born, it's a blank memory system, and then as you grow up, you fill it up and you learn things. Now, it's a, it's a memory system that's attached to some, some your senses, and you learn everything through your senses. Um, you have from your eyes, the optic nerve is about a million fibers, your somatosensory nerve is about a million fibers, your auditory nerve is about 30,000. So you've got a couple million inputs going into your brain. They're fairly high velocity, not in computer terms, but they're, they're changed on the order of tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds. Your eyes are moving every few hundred milliseconds, a completely new innervation going on. And my speech is changing on the orders of tens of milliseconds. So you've got this fast data stream coming into the brain. The brain has to build a model of the world. When you're born, you don't know about things like Google. You don't know about buildings and chairs and cars and computers and, and operating systems and bananas, none of this stuff. You, you have to learn everything. It's an amazing amount of stuff, and you have to learn it through this fast stream of data coming in. And so the, build, the New York Torxix builds a model of the world. And from that model, it does three basic things. It makes predictions about future events. It says, hey, given my current state and what's coming in, what's going to happen next? It can detect anomalies, which are just predictions that don't come true, and it can take actions. And it turns out actions are actually the same as predictions. Um, and so when we take actions, we back interact with the world. And so actually it turns out that most of the things that you experience in the world, most of the changes on your sensory organs are caused by your own actions. So as I move around the room and I turn my eyes and so on, 
I'm controlling what the patterns that are changing here. And, um, and so there's this real big tight feedback loop that goes on between a sensory and motor action. If I were to sum this all up and say, what is this system doing? This is what it's doing. The neocortex learns a sensory motor model of the world. It learns, given a sequence of sensory patterns and a sequence of actions, what's going to happen next? What do I have my expectations of what's going to happen next? Can I predict the future? And can I predict what I should do to get the future that I want? And this is, this is basically what it's all about. It's building a sensory motor model of the world. And we want to know how it does that. Well, we know a lot about it. We've learned a lot over the years. And I'm going to give you the top six principles right now. Um, and this is no particular order. Um, and this is my, I made these up. I mean, I didn't make them up. I, put my, I made the list up. But, um, but we're just going through them here. First, number one, it's an online learning system. So it's a memory system. But it's, it's got to work in an online fashion, meaning it's got to work in a streaming mode. There's, there's no batch processing. The brain doesn't get to look at the statistics of a database. It says it's coming in. I've got to act on it immediately. I have to incorporate it into my model immediately. It's an online learning system. And this is essential. In a world where patterns are always changing and where the underlying structure in the world is changing, you have to have an online learning system. You can't do this in a batch mode. And brains don't work in a batch mode. They don't know statistics in that, in that sense. The second thing is. We know that the neocortex is a hierarchy. It looks like a sheet of cells. It's just two or three millimeters thick. It's about the size of a dinner napkin for a human. Um, and, but it's, and, and, the re, and all of it looks very, very similar. But we know from anatomy and other reasons that it's, that it's actually different regions that are connected together with these nerve bundles in a hierarchical fashion. There's an estimated anywhere between dozens and maybe a, a couple hundred regions in the neocortex, a, a human neocortex, depending on how you're counting. We know that these regions are in this hierarchy. We know that information flows up the hierarchy and down the hierarchy. We also know that the regions, amazingly, seem to be doing the same thing. Um, there are slight variations to this, but the basic idea is that every region is doing the same thing. They're all doing the same type of memory function. And so it doesn't matter if, if you say, well, this is a visual area of the neocortex. It's visual because it's getting input from the optic nerve or other visual regions. And auditory areas because of where it's, where it's getting input from. And we can rewire the brains, and, they, and these regions take on new meanings and new, and new roles. So we have this hierarchy of memory regions that are all doing the same thing, which tells us that we understand what one region is doing, then, and we understand how the hierarchy works. We, we're a long way towards our, our goal. The third thing is, what is the kind of memory that it's storing? 90%, not all of it, but 90% of what the, what the neocortex is storing is sequence memory. It's, it's patterns over time. This may not be obvious to you. Let me, let me walk you through it. Um, this is almost all the inference in motor behavior is sequence memory. So you're listening to my speech, and hopefully I'm not talking too quickly. But um, the patterns are coming in over time. The order matters. You've, you have in your brain stored what words sound like and what certain phrases sound like. And your brain is matching them up in time. If we, if we move the order and pattern of those, those patterns in different order, it would be garbage, totally garbage. And, and people tend to think, like, well, vision's not like that, is it? Vision is like that. Real vision is you are moving constantly through the world. Your eyes are moving every two, three, four times a second. And, you're, and every time, this is this constant change. These are not images that are just randomly being presented to you. Your brain is directing this and is figuring out what patterns. And so when I look to the right, I know what to expect. If I look to the left, I should see Alan over here again. There he is. And so I have these expectations about the world. So even vision is this. All inference. You think about language, music, vision, even when I touch things, it's all temporal patterns. The second thing is we generate motor behavior. And motor behavior is, of course, another sequence. My speech right now is involving dozens of muscles being exercised in very precise patterns, extremely precise patterns over time to generate these, these speech patterns. And, and, and that's true for all my behavior. And so we're playing these back. These are stored patterns. Um, they're stored. I can repeat them. They're stored. I can repeat them. Because they're, it, you know, I've got these things in my head. I know these. I've learned how to do these things. I could give this talk blind and probably in my sleep. No, not true. Just for you guys. Um, <laughs> So it's all about sequence memory. And that's the key. And, and that's an area that has not been explored enough. The fourth item here is that we, when you look in the brain, we find the same type of representations. It's called sparse distributed representations. Everywhere you look, you see lots of neurons. It doesn't matter where in the brain. Very few are active. Most are relatively inactive. This is true on the sensory streams as well. Uh, we now understand a lot about this. And it's a critical component of how the whole system works. I'm going to go into detail in this talk. Uh, the fifth one here is that 
we used to think that the regions of the brain, that some were motor regions and some were sensory regions, like this is the primary visual area, this is the primary motor area, and so on. We now know this is not true. Every region of the neocortex has cells that are both, uh, both inference or sensory and motor. And they're, they're differentiated, the layer five cells are the motor cells. But everywhere you go, even primary visual cortex has cells that project to something that's motor, the, the muscles that make your eyes move. So there is no pure sensory or pure motor. In fact, this is another beautiful discovery. Essentially, what every part of the cortex is doing is sensory motor um, learning. And so we, we want to figure out how it does that. Finally, the last of my six elements here is attention. Uh, attention, there's different types of attention. I'm not going to go into detail here today. But essentially, I need to be able to attend to various parts of my input stream, various parts of what I'm doing at different points in time. Now, I claim these are the primary six things that are going on in the neocortex. And I'll make a further claim. I think they're both necessary and sufficient for biological and machine intelligence. Uh, I don't think you can, you're going to get there without these elements. It doesn't mean there aren't other things we can do. Um, but these, in my mind, are necessary and sufficient. They're necessary to learn a sensory motor model of the world. All mammals have a neocortex. And they all have these principles, from a mouse to a human, dolphins, monkeys, cats, dogs. They all have these principles operating in their brains. So you don't have to be human level to, to need these things, but they all have this going on. There's things I didn't put in this list. For example, I didn't put language. You don't need to have language to, to, be, to be smart. You need to be a human smart, yes, but to, be, to, to build a model of the world, no. Dolphins are really smart, and they have very limited language. Uh, I didn't put other things, episodic memory, dreaming. I didn't, you don't even have to have a body. You have to have motor output. But that could be all virtual in some you know, cyberspace someplace. So you know, there's a lot of things you don't have to have to be, build machine intelligence. But I believe these six elements. And if you're going to forget everything else I talk about today, just remember there's six things. And the most important one is sparse distributed representations, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, I'm going to talk about three of these, actually. Um, I'm talking about sparse distributed representations. I'm going to talk about sequence memory. And I'm going to talk about the online learning. Um, we, know, we know a lot about some of these. There's a lot of things we don't know. There's a ton of stuff I still don't know and don't understand. But we know enough that we're actually starting to build this stuff, and it works pretty, pretty well. OK, we're going to jump into sparse distributed representations. Um, the best way to understand sparse distributed representations is to think, compare it to the way we do things in computers, which I'll call dense representations. So what do we do in computers? We want to represent something. We take a word, 8 to 128 bits. I don't know what we're up to these days. We consider all combinations of ones and zeros. From 0000 to 1111. An example, of course, is ASCII code. There's a letter, the representation for the letter M. Now, we can say things like, well, what do the bits mean in this code? They don't mean anything. If I said, what's the third bit in an ASCII code mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's just the whole number means something. Well, somebody could say, well, it means an 8 bit. You know, no, it's, that's not what it means. I mean, it doesn't tell me anything about the letter M. And these representations are arbitrary. Um, they, you know, we could assign a different representation of the letter M, and it would have been just fine as long as we all use the same convention. In, in brains, it works very differently. Um, first of all, you always have lots of things. When I talk about bits, it, you can think of it as a neuron. Right? And when I say the bits are 1, the neuron's active. And the bits are 0, the neuron's not, not active. Okay? So we have many, many bits, thousands of them. And they're mostly inactive, so mostly zeros and a few ones. In our work, very often, and for this talk, I'm going to stick to an example where we're using 2,000 bits, of which 2% are active. So I have 41s and 1,960 zeros. That's how I'm going to represent everything. I can do, there's many, many ways I can pick from those, but that's how I'm going to represent everything. Now, the, th the key thing about, well, there's several key things about sparse distributed representations, but this one is that each bit has semantic meaning. It, you can actually say what it means if you, if you knew. It, these are learned. No one's going to assign it in a brain or an intelligent machine. It's learned, but it, it's relatively stable. And, and there means something. And, and so when we want to pick um, a representation, what we, it's a sort of a competitive process. We take the top 40 semantic attributes, and those are the ones that are going to be in our representation. If I were to do, if I want to represent the, letter, you know, the letters of the alphabet using sparse distributed representations, and I would not do this. This is just purely for example. Um, if I wanted to engineer this, I could say, OK, I have bits that represent, is this a consonant or a vowel? Is this, what does it sound like? Is it an A, E, I, O sound? Is it a fricative sound? Is it a hard sound, a soft sound? How do I draw it? Do I have ascenders or descenders? Is it a closed shape? Where is it in the alphabet? What's it next to? What other meanings does this thing have? And I could come up with all these attributes, and then I'd pick the top 40 that represent any particular letter. OK, that's the basic idea. Now, there's some. There's some properties with sparse distributed representations. I'm going to go through a few of them here that are really, really important. Uh, the first is semantic similarity. 
basically, if I took two sparse distributed representations and I compare them bit for bit, if they share a bit in the same location, then they're sharing semantic meaning. This is not arbitrary. This doesn't happen by chance. It's meaningful. And even just a few bits of overlap between two representations is statistically very significant, but it's also semantically significant. Now, what if I ask you to store one of these patterns? I want to remember this. And I'm going to ask you, here's a new pattern coming in. I want you to tell me if you've seen it before. All right, so you might say, well, I'll store 2,000 bits. And then the new 2,000 bits comes in. I'll check and see if it's the same thing. That's not the way we're going to do it. We're going to store the indexes of the one bits. So we're saying, OK, all you need to remember where the one bits are. And so I have 41 bits in my representation. So I'll have 40 indices to the one bits. And if I see a new representation, I look in those locations. And if I see ones, I know I got the same representation, because every representation has 40 ones. What if I told you you couldn't do that? I said you can only subsample. You can only sample of a few of the one bits. You can't store the locations of all 40. So I'll say 10. You can only pick 10. We'll randomly pick 10. Now you have indices to 10 of the one bits. Now I show you a new pattern. And you say, is this the same pattern? And you look and say, yes, the ones are all in the same location, the 10 ones I know, I know about. Is it the same pattern or not? We say, well, I don't know. What about the other 30 bits? They could be different, right? Well, it turns out that it's very unlikely to be different. But even if they were different, I'd be making a mistake, but a mistake for something that's semantically very similar to the thing I stored. And this is the key to generalization in the brain, is that you don't need to store the location of all the bits and know what everything is. You basically, when you make errors, you're making errors of semantic generalization. In fact, I could, up, I could say, you know what, it's good enough to just match five or eight of these things, and still I'd have a semantic generalization. So I have a way of scaling it back up and down. I'm going to tell you the last property here, uh, and you'll see why all this works in a moment. Uh, how we're going to use this, is one of union membership. I could take, let's say I took 10 sparse distributed representations, and I ordered them together. So now I have 2,000 bits, but instead of 2% of the bits being active, it's about 20% of the bits being active. And uh, that's a one-way street. I can't undo that. I can't say, oh, what were the 10 that, that were in there? Can't do it. But I can do something almost as good. I can show you a new sparse distributed representation and ask, is this one of the original 10 by looking at the union? And I can do that. I can say, well, just look for the ones that are in the new one and see if they're in the union. And if they are, I'm going to claim it's, it's one of the original 10. Now, you might say, hey, it could make a mistake, right? It could be picking some ones from the first one and some ones from the second one, and so on. Statistically, extremely, astronomically unlikely to happen. But even if it did make a mistake, it wouldn't matter, because I'm, I'm going to be making a mistake for something that's semantically very similar to the thing I stored earlier. And that's good enough. In fact, it's what we want. It's not even good enough. It's, it's actually desirable. OK, again, if you want to forget everything else and zone out the rest of the talk, remember the future of intelligent machines is sparse distributed representation. I'm telling you, there's no other way around it. If you want to, and, and if you want to, I was just talking to uh, John down here earlier about you know, this, I believe, is the future for understanding uh, language as well and text, because this is how the brain does it. OK, we're now going to skip to the next thing, sequence memory. This is 90% of what's being stored in your brain, at various types of sequence memory. It's not so simple, but the various types. And uh, we spent years trying to figure out how this works, and we think we got it. Let me just do this in neuroscience. If you zoom in on any section of the neocortex, doesn't matter where, you'll see there's these layers of cells, typically five layers of cells. I'm arguing that they all are a type of sequence memory. They have similar attributes. It doesn't really matter what layer you look at. What I'm talking about here would apply to any layer of cells. Um, they're all different types of sequence memory. So if we zoom in on one of those layers, what you'll see is you'll see the cells packed in there really tight. There's about 10,000 per cubic millimeter. But they have two uh, organizations which are worthwhile noting. One shown by the green arrow, which is that the cells that are in a very skinny vertical column uh, have similar response properties, especially a feed-forward response properties. They all seem to respond to the same thing in the world at, if, on a feed-forward uh, basis. However, 90% of the connections are horizontal connections across columns in different areas of the brain. So 90% of the connections are elsewhere, but we have this very strong vertical orientation. If we zoom in further and look at one of those cells, we see that the cells are dominated by this dendritic arbor, which is this tree-shaped structure around it. All the connections, the positive connections to the cell, are on the dendrites. They're not on the cell body. And so on a typical neuron, there's anywhere from several thousands, to a few tens of thousands of connections on those dendrites. If we zoom in further, and now you're looking at well, a little section of a dendrite in this picture here, you can actually see the synapses in this electromicrograph. Um, there's those little spines coming off. They're about one micron apart ranged along the, the dendrite there. We now know, and we didn't know this 15 years ago, but we now know that there's a very nonlinear effect that's happening here. If a number of these synapses become active at the same time, relatively the same time, within a few milliseconds, in a short distance from each other, with about 40 microns of each other, 
And enough of them happen at that time, then you get a very nonlinear event. You generate what's called the dendritic spike, and it goes to the cell body, and it depolarizes the cell body. The, the cell body goes in a, in a hyperactive mode. It's ready to, ready to fire. It's, it's anticipating. It's predicting. Um, so the, every little section of the dendritic tree is like a, it's like a coincidence detector. It's, it's a thresholded coincidence detector. It says, if I see a bunch of inputs at the same time, bingo. If I see the same number of inputs spread out over time or spread over the dendritic arbor, nothing happens. Um, this is such an important feature. There's hardly anybody who's modeling this today, but this is the key to understanding how the whole thing works. We didn't know about it too many years ago. Uh, we model all this. On the, in the, here's a picture of one of our simulations. Uh, on the left is a, 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 a layer of cells with four cells per column. I'm going to show more de detailed pictures of this. Our neurons, our artificial neurons, capture a, a fair amount of depth of what is going on in, in, the, in the brain, in, the, in real neurons. These colored dots represent the synapses, and, and I'm only showing some of them in this picture. The green ones are ones that are close to the cell body. I'm not going to talk them further. Those are how we form the sparse distributed representations. The blue ones are on the distal dendrites. These are the 90% of the connections. This is how we're going to learn sequences. So, and we're going to model these as a set of, uh, each cell is a set of uh, coincidence detectors, and when the pattern comes in, if it detects it, it's going to make the cell in a predictive state. All right, how does this all work? Um, how does this learn sequences? Let's start with a picture. Here's a picture of our sparse distributed representation, but now showing as a sheet of cells. Um, and the red cells are the ones that are active, and the white ones are the ones that are inactive. This is just a part of our 2,000 bits. Um, and, um, and so at any point in time, Oh, I, I, I'm not, I, this is a reminder, I'm not going to tell you how we formed this, but it's through a, a local uh, inhibitory, react, uh, inhibitory uh, competition. At any point in time, I have some pattern on here. And, and, and at another point in time, I have a different pattern. And, and so as I'm talking and as you move around the world, this is what's going on in your brain. Everywhere you look, you see these spar cells sparsely activated, and they're turning, oops, I went too far up there. Um, and you've got these patterns of changing over in time like this. And we want to learn the sequence here. We want to learn how do I learn the sequence of these distributed patterns. And the answer is the brain does it a cell at a time. Each cell learns to predict its own activity. So when a cell becomes active, what it does is it says, let me look around for guys who were previously active just a moment ago. And let me see if I can find a bunch of them, and I'm going to form connections to them. And, so, and I'm going to form those connections, as you see on the bottom right here, on one of my dendritic segments. So if I see that pattern again, I will predict my own activity. And this is the beginning of sequence memory. If we did this, um, and let's say I showed it a pattern. Here's a situation where I've showed it a pattern. The red, the red um, cells are the cells that are getting a feed-forward input. They're active. The yellow ones are, are hyperpolar or depolarized. They are predictive states. Now, why are there more yellows than reds? What if I train the system on A followed by B, and then A followed by C, and A followed by D? And I show it A. I'm going to predict B, C, and D. This is a union of predictions. This goes back to our union property earlier. Uh, I have a union of predictions, and I can tell if what happens next was one of the things I predicted or not, even though I'm predicting multiple things at the same time, which is really what we're always doing. So now this memory I've just showed you, this is a transition memory. of a, It's a first order transition memory, meaning I can only make a prediction based on my current or the, pre the, the previous time step. Well, you know, what, what's happening now, I can make a prediction with time. I can't use t history of time. But we need a high order memory. Uh, the reason we need a higher order memory is because that's the way the world is structured. The higher order memory says, I may need to go back a long way to make the correct prediction. So imagine I'm listening to a melody. I can't predict the next note by just listening to the previous note. I may need to hear five notes or six notes or ten notes. The same with speech. The, to, to, to know what I'm going to, you know, to predict what I'm going to say or understand my speech, you have to understand a long context. And the same if you're walking down the hallway. This is a high order temporal pattern. You, you know, it's like, oh, you have door, 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 then a third door on the left type of thing. This is the way the world is. So we need to make a high order uh, memory. This is a first order memory. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to use columns of cells. Uh, and let me explain how, this, how we think this works. So imagine I gave you a sparse distributed representation. But instead of each bit being a cell, I'm going to make each bit be a column of cells. So in this case, I show 10 cells per, per bit. And I'm going to randomly choose one of the bits to be, one of the cells to be active in that column. So if it's a one, co one bit, I pick a column, I pick one of those cells. I have a much sparser representation now. Instead of 2,000 cells, I have 20,000 cells. Um, now, I could pick the same sparse distributed representation a moment later and use a different set of cells. I just randomly pick a different set of cells in the columns. And so I have a different representation. It's the same sparse distributed representation, the same columns, but different cells. If you uh, just think about this, we have 40 active columns. There's 10 cells per column. So there's 10 to the 40th different ways to represent the same input in different contexts. 
So here's an example. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a sentence that has a, a sound repeated four times. There are too many two twos to count. Now, the sound two was used four times in that sentence. You didn't get confused. If it was a force, first order memory, you would get confused. But it's not, you didn't. And you heard them, even though it was the same sound, they had different meanings at different points. So at one point in the brain, you had to have the same representation because the same sound's coming in on your cochlea. At another point in the brain, you had to have a different representation because you didn't see the, hear them as the same. And that's what's going on here. We have these columnar representations, and it allows us to create very long, high-order high sequence memories. I'm not going to walk you through all the details of how this works. You'll just have to take my word. You can read it on our website if you want. Um, but uh, in the end, if you do this and you use the same side of learning rules I was just talking about a moment ago, you form a sequence memory of sparse distributed representations. It's, it's variable order. It can be as high order as the statistics, statistics allow, so it's not like fixed order. Uh, it's distributed. It can do multiple simultaneous predictions about what's going to happen next. It's very high capacity. This little memory here can learn millions of transitions. And it allows for semantic generalization. Imagine if I train this, this on a series of patterns. And now I give it a new series of patterns that are not exactly the same representations, but they have some bits overlapping with them. So they're semantically similar. I can apply my sequence memory to what was a previous learning to a new input that is semantically similar. And that's what the brain does. OK, um, my last thing I'm going to talk about is how we do online learning. This is the, th the third of my six elements I'm going to talk about here. And uh, what is this all about? Well, it basically means because we're doing online learning, you have to train on every moment in time, every new input to the system. And essentially, you don't know if it's noise or something valuable, so you have to train on it. And basically, if it doesn't repeat, you forget it. And if it repeats, you want to remember it. So that's pretty much what it is. Now, here's a little bit of neuroscience you probably don't know. Unless, maybe you do, but probably don't. Um, we used to think, don't pay attention, just listen to me for a second. Um, we used to think that all memory in, in formation in the brain was the strengthening and weakening of synapses. And clearly that happens to some extent. Uh, but we've now learned that something much more important happens in memory, which is we can form new synapses very rapidly, and we can forget them very rapidly. So instead of just strengthening a connection, we can form new ones. And that's a much bigger pool of potential things you can connect to. We can do this in the order of just a few tens of a seconds that you can form a completely new connection. So even one exposure is enough to do this often, uh, to form a new neuron. So these guys on the dendritic tree, there, those spines, if you look on real neurons, some of them are very there for very long periods of time. Some come and go every day um, as you're learning things. So we will actually, it's, there's much higher information capacity in forming new synapses than strengthening old ones. In fact, in the real brains, synapses are highly stochastic. They're very unreliable. So if anyone shows you a neural model that has you know, precision of two digits or one digit of precision that's required in a, in a synaptic weight, forget it. It doesn't work like that. Um, so the way we do this is we model this growth. We say that we have something called the, the permanence, which is a scalar. It goes between 0 and 1, which is essentially modeling the growth of a synapse. So I can start growing a synapse and not make a connection. If it gets above a certain threshold, if the permanence gets above a threshold, we then say the synapse is connected. And we just give it a weight of 1. We have binary weights. We don't try to be more fancier than that. Um, but we have this idea of a permanence. And once I'm over a threshold, if I keep, pre keep um, re re reinforcing this, my permanence can, can go up. This, the connection doesn't get stronger, but the permanence goes up, and it makes it harder to forget. So you want to do that because you have things repeated many times, or you want to make it so it's very hard to forget. So that's how we do that. If you put this all together and you say, hey, I want to simulate one of these things, which is what we do all the day, all day long, you have 2,000 columns. 30, we do 30 cells per column, 128 segments per cell, 40, segments, uh, 40 connections per segment. These are all very realistic numbers in, in neuroscience. You put this all together, you basically have about 300 million in this little model, about 300 million synapses. Each one has a connection index and a connection permanence. The connections are very, very sparse. There's a lot of tricks we can do to make this run fast. And noticeably, there's no single points of failure here. You can drop out synapses, drop out dendrites, drop out cells, drop out columns. The system keeps behaving very nicely. This is a lot of appeal for hardware guys who, um, as we talked about building this stuff in, in, in silicon. OK, I'm now going to switch gears. I'm going to talk about, and I think it's very important to build this stuff and make it work and prove it and make commercial value out of it. So we're going to do that. Uh, we have been doing that. I'm going to give you, a, we're, we're, we're applying this in the space of data. I'm going to give you a lot of my take on data. This is the data company. I'm, I'm nervous as hell talking to anybody about data here uh, because you guys are the data. You own the data. <laughs> you be the data. Um, so, but today, this is my view of the world, very simplistic view of the world. Today, we're getting huge numbers of sources of data. It's growing exponentially. We stick them in databases. Um, the vast majority of the data in the world is never looked at, ever. It just sits there. 
we have two ways of, of inf getting value out of it. One is through visualization tools, and the other is creating models. And then if we use those models, we can act on them. There are challenges here. One, part, one of the biggest challenges is that this whole system is not very automated. Um, and it takes data scientists, people like you, to do this stuff. And uh, we, we want to get to a world where there's not just hundreds or thousands or millions of models. We want to get to one where there's billions of models, the Internet of Things. You know, everything in the world is going to be creating data. And we need to be able to model all this stuff. Uh, the other problem is, is, and so today it takes lots of people. It's not automated. The other problem is the models can get obsolete. If you're not doing online learning, and most techniques today are not online learning, you have to rebuild your models all the time because the patterns in the world change. And, and people just aren't really, they're not looking at temporal data very much. Um, much of the patterns in high velocity data, especially high velocity data, is temporal patterns. And that's almost, very rarely do people take advantage of that. Uh, they actually try to get rid of it. Um, so I, my view of the world tomorrow, it's not that the current world's going to go away, but this is where I think the growth is going to be, is we're going to go to a world where there's literally, I'm not joking, billions of, of uh, machine learning models out there. The data is going to stream right into the models. There's no storage required. You're not going to save the stuff. The models are going to build and continually update themselves, and you're going to immediately take it to actions. And so um, this, if you look at it, looks just like what brains do. Go back to what I said earlier. I said, whoa, look at that. So let's try to apply our techniques to this. And so that's what we've been doing. We've, um, the key criteria here is you need to have automated model creation for billions of models. You need to have continuous learning. And you need to be able to find the temporal as well as the spatial patterns in the data. So uh, we built a product called Grok. It's, a, it's a, uh, an engine for acting on data streams. It's essentially a productized version of the thing I was just telling you about. On the left, you can see we have, we have streams of records of data coming in through time. It can be one or more fields. We run those fields through encoders, which are just like your sensory organs. Uh, literally, they're modeled after sensory organs, uh, uh, modeled after cochlea. Um, and we can turn them into sparse distributed representations. Those encoders can be fairly generic. We do not have to do new ones for do every different problem we solve. It, we use a set of generic encoders. Um, we then get um, sparse distributed representations. We, and uh, oh, by, we can put in field, any kind of numbers, categories, text, dates, times. You can do custom things as well if you want to, semi-structured semi data. We run this through the sequence memory I was just telling you about. And it basically looks for the this, this spatial and the temporal statistics of that data. It can make predictions. It can detect anomalies. And then from that, we take actions. Uh, what the user has to do in this case, they have to define the problem. This is actually tricky. They have to do a good job at this. Then they have to stream the data. Grok creates the models. It learns the, it learns the spatial temporal patterns in the data. It outputs predictions with uh, percentages. You know, it's a probability distribution. And it can detect anomalies. And we're finding lots of applications for this. Uh, we're finding in energy, and I'll tell you some more, product forecasting, anomaly detection, server loads. I'm just going to walk you through a few simple examples, and then I'm going to speculate a little bit for you. Uh, today, this is all running on an Amazon cloud. It doesn't have to be, but that's just the way we implement it to begin with. There's a simple REST API to use it and some web apps to help you get started, although it's only in a private mode still. We're still doing this with customers uh, handing, hand, held holding them. Um, we see a lot of applications in the energy space. I'm going to show you this one because it's very simple to see, and it's, it's, it, that's the main reason I'm going to start with it. It's very simple. You may not be realizing that this is a thing called demand response, which is um, large consumers of electricity actually bid on price of, of power throughout the day. And the utilities will say, if you can use X amount of power at 3 o'clock, I'll give you this price. If you use Y amount of power, I'll give you this price. And they're trying to, they're trying to figure out how to do all this. And if you could predict both your demand or the supply, you can save energy and you can save money. So there's a lot to be saved here. Um, here's a, a, a factory in France, and in Paris, actually. And this is a very simple one. It's just showing the electrical usage throughout a week. You can see the five days. They're not working on the weekend, apparently, um, because it's kind of low there at the last two days. And the problem with the customer wanted to do is they said, they said at midnight, they have to sort of make their bids. And at midnight, they, have to, they want to make predictions every hour for the next 24 hours. We had to put a little wrapper around uh, the, this learning algorithm to get this to work, but we, we, we can do that. So and what we do is you get something like this. Now, here's, here's the actual and predicted. Now, this looks great. Pay no attention. You really can't tell if it's good or not, because you have to really look at statistics and look at the data carefully. But it turns out this was very good. The customer was happy with this. Um, the red is predicted. The blue is actual. We can follow this pretty well. Here's a situation where the system was just trained uh, on a few, uh, a few months of data. And here we are on Wednesday. And Thursday morning, it starts picking up. And it says, hey, it starts to pick up. And it didn't happen. And the reason is because it was a holiday. And we didn't know about this holiday. And the system was never trained on holiday. So it says, oh. And then it says, I, that wasn't right. And it starts to say, this looks like a weekend. So it started acting like a weekend. Um, here's another example. Same idea, but a little bit more complex. The sense that it's not so obvious all the time. 
This is a company that does, um, that does video uh, encoding. They have a service level agreement with their customers. They have to guarantee their quick turnaround, so they have to leave extra servers running on the cloud all the time in case the peak in demand. So they're always trying to manage how many servers do I leave running, uh, which are wasting energy and, and, and electricity uh, and power and, and money, uh, but I have to meet my service level agreement. If they could predict customer demand better, then they could leave fewer of these extra servers running around. So here you can see the data. It's quite spiky. There's no obvious patterns in it. We can't predict all the spikes. It's impossible. But the question is, can we discern some patterns in this data to do better than any other technique they've had, and can we do this in an automated way? And the answer is yes to both of those. Um, we can do it better than they can do it, and we can do it in an automated way. So in a sense, basically we just feed the data, and Grok is saying, you know, you know, I won't go through all the details of it, but it was a successful application. I want to give you a little sense of what it's like if you looked inside of this system. So just pay attention to the right side of these images. Um, here we're looking down on the 2000, actually 2048, but 2000 columns. Um, and, and the green dot means that this was predicted and it actually occurred. So we're looking, we're sort of probing inside of this cortical learning algorithm right now. And this is a case where we, you know, what occurred was exactly what was predicted. This occurs quite a lot. It's not, not unusual. Here's a situation where we predicted multiple things, but one of the ones that we predicted was occurred. So we have more of these little blue circles of things that were predicted but didn't occur. But that's not a mistake as long as the things that did occur were predicted. Those are the green dots. So I have 40 green dots and maybe 80 blue dots, something like that. Here's a situation where things didn't work too well. And I'm sorry you probably can't see this too well in the back of the room. Um, there's a bunch of red circles in here as well. And those red circles are things that weren't predicted but did occur. Those are true anomalies. Uh, I didn't expect this to happen, and it did happen. But this is, shows you sort of typically what happens here. We, it's not an all or nothing affair. An, an anomaly is not one thing. It's like, well, some of the things I predicted did occur. Some of the things I predicted didn't occur. And some of the things that occurred didn't, weren't predicted. So I could even, if I wanted to, I could go in here and say, well, semantically, what was, what was wrong and what was right? Uh, we don't do that, per se, but that's how the system works on its own. So there's a lot of subtlety here. Here's a case where we used it with a, um, um, uh, this is an offshore windmill, and this is looking at the, uh, the oil temperature in the gear case in a large offshore windmill in the North Sea. Uh, the blue line is the temperature, and it's going up and down throughout the day as the windmill's speeding up and slowing down. And the question is, could we detect anomalous behavior? And uh, the red line at the bottom is, is the anomaly score which, uh, which Grok is putting out. And here you can see an uh, interesting event. We had two peaks here. Uh, the, the, the earlier stuff is when the system was first started being trained. But here we have two peaks. And the important thing is the first peak is when the system started acting a little bit unusual. It wasn't out of range. It wasn't out of, it wasn't out of spec in terms of like it was too high or too low, the temperature. But it was started oscillating in a way that I hadn't seen before. So Grok says, that's unusual. I haven't been able, I'm not able to predict that as well. And so you have a peak. And then the second peak is when the system actually went down for failure and they worked on it. We think there's a large, there's a ton of applications here detecting anomalies. OK, here's my dangerous slide. My dangerous slide said, hey, if I was Google, how would I use this? I'd love to have you guys as a customer. That's not, not why I'm here, but I'd love to have you as a customer. I said, well, we've had a lot of interest in the advertising space, online advertising. And we've shown that we can, for people who, who basically have uh, uh, you know, real estate to sell, they, they're always trying to pick what ad network to pick. And, um, and so uh, we've shown that we can predict the expected um, uh, you know, return on a particular ad network, which changes throughout the day all the time. You want to do this almost like on a 15-minute basis. Um, we can do that on a per network, per app, per demographic basis. And essentially, the user can decide, well, how do I prioritize what, where do I serve my ads from? Uh, we don't really care what the patterns mean. It's just there are patterns there, and, we, and they change, and we find them. Um, we can't get it all right all the time again. We're just trying to do better than they're doing today. We have a lot of interest in the finance world. Uh, this is not, you can't predict stock prices. Forget it. It's not going to happen. But you can, and we've shown that we can successfully predict volume and volatility better than the industry standards today. And this is valuable for various reasons. We also believe, we haven't done this yet, but we have a lot of interest in detecting anomalous trading. Both this is internal to companies because they're, they're trying to pick up rogue traders, you know. Uh, we also think we can do it uh, in, in a, across a huge number of obtuse, weird trading combinations. So when something becomes all of a sudden more predictable, it represents a trading opportunity, um, which for some reason, not many people in trading are saying, bingo, you could do that. It's not my favorite application, but I think there's going to be a lot of applications there. Uh, I mention this because Google, because you guys, I have to admit, you're, you're not first in everything. Yeah, I was still ahead of you in finance, I think. And um, you could add some really cool things to your, your financial stuff if you had these kind of capabilities. Uh, you guys do a lot of computers. You have the biggest server farms in the world. Uh, we've, we found some really interesting applications in managing computer resources, like I mentioned with the earlier example. 
Um, predicting demand, uh, resource balancing. Uh, I've even heard a crazy idea, a great idea, where someone says, you know, different servers have different efficiencies running different applications. And, um, and if you can predict the efficiency, you could switch down some servers and bring up others and save energy. I think it's really cool. Uh, a lot of oops, a lot of a lot of work in the in the in the energy space for us. We're, we're getting hit on this all the time. You guys are involved in smart grid, solar, wind, demand response. This could be something great for you guys. And finally, I love your cars. Um, and uh, you know, maybe something in that area. You could predict where parking spots are going to be or routing people, things like that. Okay. Um, if you want more details on Grok, if you want more details on these algorithms, there's a white paper on our, on our website, uh, and you can read about the stuff on the website. I'm now going to switch to my last part of this presentation. Um, which I'm going to talk about, I'll just speculate a little bit about the future of machine intelligence. Because uh, I'm really passionate about this stuff, as you probably can tell. So uh, what's the future? Is it like this? <laughs> Skynet, the Matrix, the Terminator. Ah, no, I, I, I'm not a big science fiction fan, but I tell these, I'm told these are bad things. Um, <laughs> or, or is the future something nice, like this? Like, you know, little robot butlers like C-3PO, or we're going to play games with watching, or maybe we'll come up with new ways of entertaining ourselves. Uh, you know, is that the future? <laughs> Uh, or is the future ambiguous? Um, you know, maybe it's good, but it turns bad. Um, so I don't know. But I, I'm going to tell you some things. I've, I have some prognostications here. I'll just tell you where I think this is going. Um, here's some things I think is definitely going to happen. And not, I'm not talking 100 years from now. This is going to happen. And, we, and, and the reason I'm here is because I'm trying to make it happen sooner. Um, we can make machine intelligence that's faster and bigger than, than biological intelligence. So we can definitely make machine intelligence that's a million times faster than biological brains. Neurons can't do anything less than five milliseconds. That's their maximum throughput. Um, we can do a lot better than that. Now, I can't just speed up a brain if I don't speed up its sensory organs and I don't speed up its data streams and so on. But I don't see any reason why we can't do that. In virtual worlds, we should be able to make machines that are a million times faster um, and think a million times faster than humans think. We can make them bigger. Um, that's not the only goal. But there's no reason at all we can't make bigger neocortexes. Um, and you know you can't make it smarter just by making it bigger. That's that's a that's a mistake. You can't just say make it bigger and it'll be smarter. You still have to learn. You still have to be exposed to things. It takes 20 years to train a human. Um, you know we have to come up with these are training systems and they have to be exposed to environments. But there is no question in my mind that we can make deeper thinking machines than humans. Um, we, this is there I get very excited about. We can do super senses. We should not be thinking about the senses of machine intelligent machines as hearing and vision and touch. Uh, why not? You know, I was just showing we have sensors that are looking at oil temperatures. We can have sensors that look at anything. We can have distributed sensors. We can have microscopic sensors that work inside of cells. Um, all kinds of things where humans, we have an impedance mismatch because of our, our own senses. We spend a tremendous amount of time trying to come up with ways of looking and thinking and experiencing stuff that we can't normally experience. But we could build artificial brains and experience it naturally. Uh, we can do fluid robo robotics. We're nowhere close to this today, but I think we can get there. And finally, this is another idea. The, the, the neocortex is the hierarchy. And in the brain, they're all co-located because we have to run these wires between them and the, the, the neurons between them. But in a, in a machine intelligent world, we don't have to do that. We can have parts of the hierarchy all over the place. We can have a distributed hierarchy. We can have hierarchies on top of hierarchies. I don't even know where that's going to go yet. But um, the idea that it doesn't have to be co-located. And as long as we get the communications right, that would be very interesting stuff. This is all going to happen. Here's some things that might happen. I don't know. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, humanoid robots. Maybe, maybe not. Will we have something like C-3PO? Uh, I think it's probably technical possible. It's going to be very, very difficult, because if you want them to be human-like, they have to have all kinds of other stuff that makes them human-like. They have to have the rest of the brain, and they have to have all these emotional things, and so on. Um, so, and I'm not sure that's really where the, the, the business is going to be. You know, I know a lot of people want to do this, but uh, to me it's like this is sort of a sideshow. And, and, when, and when new technologies come along, we always sort of imagine these things. When the steam engine came along, they imagined steam engine robots, right? That's where the term robot came from. But it didn't happen. So I don't know. It may happen. Um, will we have computer brain interfaces for all? Like, you know, the matrix, you plug it in the back and go, whoa, you know. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. There's a lot of technical problems there. I'm not sure we really want to have that. Uh, who knows? Um, Here's some things I don't think are going to happen. Um, I don't think you're going to upload your brain to anything. Um, sorry to say. And there's, there's two reasons for this, really. One is, um, I mean, forget about the, the incredible, difficult technical problems. Just forget about that. Um, but, but the memory in your brain is intimately tied to the wetware of your brain and the wetware of your body. And you would have to recreate the entire thing, in some sense, to get those connections to be meaningful in another form. I also think it would be quite unsatisfactory. 
Imagine if I went up to you right today and said, you know, you can upload your brain to this computer. Do you want to do it? And you say, yeah, sure. And I say, yeah, I want to live forever, you know? And then you say, okay, we did it. And then the computer comes out, hey, that's great, I'm awake. And I say, we're done with you. We can get rid of you. And he says, whoa, wait a second, I'm still here. I mean, it's, it's like <laughs> you're not going to feel so good. It, and in the end, then those two things will, will diverge. It's just like, you might as well just have kids. It's the same thing. <laughs> Finally, I don't think we're going to have evil robots. These, you know, these things aren't going to turn one day become sentient and say, I don't want to be controlled anymore. You, know, you are dead. Uh, it's not going to happen. It, it, you know, these are not replicating things. These are not emotional things. These are not humans. They don't want to have sex. They're not hungry. Um, we're just trying to use the principles by which the brain works to build really, really useful things for society. And finally, uh, we can be certain that it's not going to be only for friendly uses as well. People will do bad things with this, but that's true of every technology. All right, my last slide. Uh, why do this? Why do we care? Why am I so passionate about this? Why do I try to get other people to be passionate about it? Um, well, there's two reasons. Uh, first is, is to live better. There's no question in my mind, just like computers have improved our lives tremendously. And the products that you guys built have improved our lives tremendously. Um, and my life has benefited from that. Uh, I think having intelligent machines is a way of improving our lives. We can make the world safer. We can make it more energy efficient. We can make the world um, a better, a better health. Uh, all the things we want to do. It's, there's no question at all that this is a, 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 a ability to move that needle significantly. But there's another reason too, which is, is, is to learn more. If I sit back and say, what's the purpose in life? Why do I, you know, why, why should anyone care that I live here and you live here and so on? In the end, long after many drinks and so on, I come to the conclusion that the, that the goal in life is to acquire knowledge and to make sure that knowledge is preserved. And this is what we do as scientists. This is what we do as we're inquisitive as species. We want to understand how the world works. We want to understand the universe. We want to understand when did it begin and when did it end. I want to know those answers too. And we could use tools to help us do this. Imagine we could have physicists that are a million times smarter and faster than us and never get tired. And they think about this stuff. What if we want to explore the universe? Are we going to say, you know, we're finding human uh, Earth-like planets only 13 light years away. Isn't that great? That was in the news this morning. I think that's wonderful. How long would it take to get a human there? And will they survive? Probably not. If we want to explore the universe, I think we have to do it with machines that don't breathe oxygen and uh, are not sensitive to things we are sensitive to. So to me, in the end here, it's all about accelerating knowledge accretion. And uh, I think there's a way of amazingly accelerating that. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you. So with that, we have a few minutes for questions. If you have questions, please come to the mic. Ray? Sure. Hi, Ray. <clears throat> hi, hi, Jeff. Uh, great presentation. Uh, on your model, uh, I agree. I like it, and I agree with the thrust of it. I wanted to focus on one aspect of it, which is the use of scalars. You mentioned scalars in the context of the completion of a connection with a view towards its permanence. Uh, but the properties are basically represented by binary uh, values. Uh, either there is a fricative or the loop is closed or it isn't. Yes. So in building systems that have at least uh, many of the attributes of your model, uh, in trying both binary properties and then probabilistic properties, as an 82% chance as a fricative, and then using Bayesian reasoning to combine them appropriately, I've gotten better results with the probabilistic. Yes. Uh, properties. So I was wondering. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll rephrase the question just to make sure everyone understands. It's a great question, um, uh, and I'll expand it because we've we've done two things. One is our our neuron activations are binary as well, and our synapses are binary. The synaptic weights are binary. And the question is, can you get better results, or you get better results using probabilistic or scalar values for those? Uh, and we actually know for certain that the uh, in the brain that neurons actually have uh, scalar outputs. They have uh, firing rates. Um, and we know that synapses are also scalars. Um, now, I mentioned earlier also that the, 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 the synapses are very stochastic, so a large percentage of the time they don't work at all. Um, so uh, that's an argument for not relying on scalar properties. But the, 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 the thrust of the answer here is uh, we've taken a shortcut. We've said that uh, because we have distributed representations, um, you do not need to rely on, in, on the accuracy of any scalar value anywhere in the system. And it's much quicker and simpler to implement this as binary activations and binary um, 
uh, synaptic weights. Uh, I'm not saying it's realistic, but given the principles I understand what's going on, I can back off to it and make my, my system run much, much more reliably. Uh, we spent a great deal of time trying to make rock run fast. We can do an inference, a uh, learning inference cycle in 10 milliseconds. And we need to do this because you know, if you're going to build a practical system, you have to make these things perform. So that was an engineering choice we made. It's not a biological choice. And I'm not disagreeing with you. It probably would get better results if I did it with a scalar. Okay. Uh, just a quick uh, question on your view of Markram's project, because I've had this debate with him over the past summer. And he expects. Uh, simulating at the molecular level, which of course is not the right way to build AI, but uh, it may be a good way to verify our, our models of biology. But uh, the, by 2020, he'll be able to simulate it at 100 times real time, and you'll be able to actually have a conversation with it. And he said, how are you going to have a conversation with it? Uh, because if, if you're absolutely perfect in your model, uh, it's not going to do anything, just like a human brain doesn't do anything unless it's gone through years of learning. And if you're at 100 times real time, how are you going to have it learn uh, about the world and have a conversation? So, uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, fundamental issues with that project. I would agree. But you know, I, look, I'm I'm excited. Anybody wants to do any of this stuff, um, and uh, you know, maybe we'll learn some from it. And so look at the positive side. Um, I think they've they, they've now taken that project and, and view it more as a way of simulating like drug interactions and all those kinds of things like that. So yes. So I want to extend Ray's question a little bit, which is um, I, I appreciate that you've taken the last 15 years of advanced uh, neuroarchitectural understandings and built that into your model. Fantastic. Um, in the past 15 years, there's also been an advance in slow, things like slow potentiation, hormonal neural response, and so on. And people like Antonio Damasio and Joe Ledeau are saying that that's actually fundamental to cognition, and yet it doesn't appear to be in your model any place. So uh, how it, do you it, reconcile Well, so, so can I sum it up in sort of the emotional content, effective content of the brain? Is that, is that a, a, a reason? But, but there's also underlying neural and hormonal mechanisms yeah, that sure. account for a lot of that. Yeah, so, so, um, so I, just to, I, I want to make sure I address the question. But um, So there's a lot of stuff in the brain, a lot. You've picked one that I didn't talk about. There's synchronies, there's all kinds of rhythms, and so on, right? Um, and so this particular one is that there's, uh, there's this, the, the hormonal aspects. There are multiple neuromodulators that are distributed throughout the neocortex that are fundamental for learning. Um, but again, when you look at it and you can say, well, is it important for, that, for a machine intelligence to have those? Um, why, you know, we have ones that are based on fear and based on reward and so on. Um, we have an emo emotional system in our system, uh, in our, our models. It's a switch. It says learn or don't learn. Um, and um, it's a very crude emotional system, but it, if it, it's good enough for what we need to do. Um, if I were to build a system that's interacting in social networks with people and having conversations and trying to get food and trying to have sex and trying to stay warm, there's a whole bunch of other things that might, you, wanna, you might want to have other effective things. And then, just to be clear, in the brain, the parts of the brain that actually evaluate emotional content or emotional saliency are not in the neocortex. They're small areas. They're subcortical. They project the neurotransmitter throughout the neocortex, so they have a global effect like, learn this. Don't forget this. You just nearly died. Um, you know, this was a bad piece of chicken. Don't eat again. Um, then, uh, but you know, from what we're trying to do, which is you know, ex figure patterns in data and structure data and so on, it's not necessary at this point in time. Um, but I don't think it's, it's not a fundamental aspect of, it's a fundamental aspect of being a human, but it's not a fundamental aspect of intelligence. All right. That's how I probably put that. Um, in all of your examples of practical applications, you seem to be pre predicting one dimensional data. Did you use only one dimension of input as well? No. So when I mean, you say one dimension, I assume you mean like uh, multiple factors. Um, I mean that uh, it's a it's a scalar value. They well, the scalars it could be it could be well, we we handle one or more fields of scalars, uh, enumerated types, dates, and times, and um, so did I answer that question yet? I, I didn't. Ex is, I, what like, we do is we, we end is, up forming a single. Does your model perform significantly worse if it doesn't have the addition? Well, we we find out. Thing. So I didn't tell you about how this works. Well, the way the actual user would use Grok is they provide uh, multiple data streams. They tell us what they want to predict. We do an evolutionary search uh, through model space to figure out which factors help make better predictions and which don't. So, and then how to encode those factors. 
So in the end, you end up with, you know, and sometimes we actually run these as ensembles of models. We have multiple models running at the same time, and, and they're competing with each other. So, um, uh, so the, the answer to the question is Grok tries to figure out what, if all the data you give it, which ones are the best, the most predictive, or which ones are the most, which factors help, how to use them. Uh, sometimes uh, some factors help, sometimes it doesn't. For example, in that particular case with the windmill, um, if, you, if you included wind speed as well as oil temperature, it's usually helpful. Um, but it does pretty well without it, so uh, it depends. It really depends. All right. Now, what you've described is a system for predicting data. That does not seem to me to be a complete solution to, shall we say, general intelligence, at least, or an autonomous system. Do you... What do you see as being necessary to complete the system yeah. in All that right. sense? Um, I, did everyone, I hope everyone heard that question. So there's a lot. Uh, I only showed three of my six elements, right? We did not have a motor component. We don't have attention. We don't have a hierarchy. We built something that's very small. We built something that's one millionth the size of a human neocortex, one thousandth the size of a mouse neocortex. Okay? It is really small. It's 60,000 neurons. It's teeny. Uh, I'm not calling that a sentient, you know, being. This is like a teeny little piece of tortex that's learning patterns. Um, but the, the key elements, I, I, my argument is that if you, if you get all six of those elements, all six of those things, including, so the hierarchy is so it's basically a scale, necessary for scale. The sensory motor is a huge component of this because you have to explore the world. Um, and I'm working on that right now. We're making good progress on that. Um, and, and then the attentional component. So you have to add all this stuff together. Um, before you can start claiming you've got something that's close to machine intelligence. Okay, thank uh, you. Great. It's, uh, it's 12 o'clock right now, so uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Jeff. It's been a really, really thank great you. time. Thank you.